the fluorescent lights buzzed a low, maddening hum above Ethan's head. He rubbed his blurry eyes, the blue glow of the old CRT monitor staining his vision even after he looked away. A fresh cup of coffee sat forgotten beside the keyboard, its steam dissipating in the stale office air. Found it, Ethan muttered to himself. It wasn't a shout of triumph, but rather a weary exhale. He'd been neck deep in the code base for days. It was the sort of legacy project nobody wanted to touch, an archaic payroll system for a fading manufacturing plant. It was boring, but the predictability was strangely comforting compared to his usual work. Normally, he was highly engaged in bleeding-edge VR simulations, not fixing COBOL bugs from the 1980s. What he'd found in this mess wasn't a bug. It looked deliberate. A single line nestled amongst thousands. Ethan blinked, rubbed his eyes again, and then squinted at the monitor. If real equals false, then go to ten. The line made zero sense. It was nonsensical in the context of a payroll program. The variable real wasn't declared anywhere. Go to ten? That archaic command would send the program spiralling back to its start, an infinite loop, a crude, terrible way to ensure a program never ended. Ethan stared, heart beginning a slow, heavy thud against his ribs. Real equals false. Did that mean... No, no, this is ridiculous, he said aloud, his voice jarringly loud in the empty office probably just an old debugging thing someone forgot to remove. Maybe even a bored programmer's joke, something to amuse whoever had the misfortune of digging through this in the far future. Ethan pictured a grizzled programmer in the same chair thirty years hence, cursing in bemusement at the absurdity. Yet, doubt nibbled at his mind. This wasn't sloppy code, it was precise. The syntax was clean, the go to command was an odd choice given its inefficiency. It felt intentional. He leaned back, his wheeled chair creaking. What to do? His career was built on logic, on the concrete predictability of code. And now this, a single line hinting at a possibility that shattered everything he thought he knew. Could he trust his eyes? More importantly, could he trust his mind? The absurdity of the situation threatened to gnaw away Ethan's sanity. He found himself staring around the office, as if the cracked linoleum tiles and peeling drop ceiling held the answer to this existential puzzle. They didn't. Decision time. On one hand, this could be nothing, a remnant of the past echoing into an otherwise mundane present. On the other... The curiosity gnawed at him like a thousand tiny insects under his skin. He could follow the go-to, dig deeper, see where the maddening loop led. Ethan took a long pull from the cold coffee, grimacing at its bitterness. His stomach churned with nerves. This was far beyond fixing a paycheck calculation error. This was messing with something that might best be left undisturbed. It was like a digital Pandora's box. What horrors might spring out if he opened it? And yet, the itch wouldn't abate. The programmer's curse of, but what if, plagued him. He was the sort of man who took apart clocks as a kid, just to see how they worked. It was his nature, the thing that made him both a brilliant coder and, perhaps, a little bit unhinged when confronted by a sufficiently intriguing mystery. Darn, he muttered fingers flying back to the keyboard with grim determination. Changing line 10 was simple enough. Rem if real equals false, then go to 10. The old basic REM would render the strange command inert, let the program run its course properly. A tiny edit, a flick of the wrist, and he could put this whole thing behind him. Carry on pretending none of this ever happened. His finger hovered over the enter key. This was real. This was his choice. The tension made his fingernail ache as he pressed the key. It felt momentous, like a point of no return. The screen flickered. 
the payroll program obediently chugging through its calculations, a wave of relief washed over him, followed by a sharp spike of disappointment. It was just a joke after all, something left behind to mess with him. That's all it was. Ethan leaned back, expecting normality to settle back into the world. But it didn't. The room seemed oddly flat now. The hum of the fluorescence grew louder, more oppressive. The air crackled with a tension he couldn't explain. He knew with bone-deep certainty that he hadn't neutralised a nonsense command. He'd unlocked something. A sound made his head snap up. He was alone in the building after hours. Yet, there it was again, the faintest scraping coming from inside his dusty cubicle. Ethan's pulse quickened as he stood, an unfamiliar prickle of fear running down his spine. Rounding the corner he saw it, a sliver of darkness beneath the battered metal desk. It looked impossibly black, a void that sucked the light from the room. It was as if someone had punched a tiny hole in the fabric of the world and it was growing. The scraping intensified, now accompanied by a click-clack like an insect's legs against tile. Ethan's feet wouldn't obey his frantic commands to move, to run. He could only stare, horrified, as the darkness spread like spilled ink onto the floor, reaching toward him. And then, an impossible shape unfolded from that inky patch. Segmented limbs, too many to count a bulbous thorax covered in iridescent chitin. But worst of all was the head, if you could call it that. Two multifaceted eyes like clusters of black jewels and a clicking, gaping maw. The creature's mandibles clacked, a sound that cut through Ethan's scream before it could even start. And the world went dark. Light pierced Ethan's eyelids, harsh fluorescent light. He jolted upright, heart pounding, breath ragged, his cubicle. The CRT monitor flickered before him, a payroll run in progress. His coffee sat steaming beside it. Just an exceptionally vivid nightmare then. Thank God, he breathed, wiping sweat from his brow. Yet the relief was fleeting. His skin still prickled, and an unsettling wrongness clung to the air. It was the feeling you get when you think you've put something back where you found it, but it's slightly off-kilter. He glanced at the floor. Clean linoleum, no trace of inky blackness or monstrous bugs. Ethan stared at the screen, his fingers resting on the keys. Those lines of code, had he dreamed them too? No, his muscle memory knew the rough shape of them the feel of uncommenting the line. With shaking hands he typed, his eyes glued to the screen for any flicker, any sign that the waking nightmare might not have been a dream after all. Rem if real equals false. Then go to ten. Real equals false, he muttered under his breath. The absurdity of that statement, the metaphysical rabbit hole it implied, sent a fresh wave of unease crashing over him. Maybe he shouldn't have looked. Maybe knowing was worse than the uncertainty. His desk phone trilled, the shrill sound shattering his thoughts. Ethan, it's Carl, in security. Was just checking. You've been here awfully late, came the guard's gruff voice. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Carl. Got held up. Leaving now, Ethan replied, his own voice sounding hollow in his ears. He grabbed his jacket desperate to be away from the flickering screen, the lingering sense of unseen eyes on his back. Maybe there was no simulation, no monstrous creature lurking outside the confines of real. Or maybe he'd just seen past the digital veil and the monsters were waiting for him to peek behind the curtain again. Ethan found his usual walk home unsettling. The streetlights seemed too dim, casting long warped shadows. The rustle of leaves was too loud, like whispers in an unknown tongue. He kept glancing over his shoulder, half expecting to see an impossible, many-legged shape loping after him. His apartment, normally a sanctuary, felt foreign. In the harsh glare of the overhead lights, 
he could almost see the rough outlines of code overlaying the room, variables flickering, unseen go-to loops waiting to be triggered. He tossed his jacket on the couch and poured himself a stiff drink. The burn in his throat was reassuring, grounding. Yet it didn't banish the persistent thought. He could no longer trust what his senses told him. Exhaustion and whiskey eventually led to a fitful sleep full of segmented horrors and flashing lines of code. He woke with the taste of metal in his mouth and a pounding, insistent beat echoing in his head. It took him a few disorienting moments to realise the sound was the doorbell. Ethan stumbled to the door, squinting through the peephole. Two figures stood outside, dressed in pristine black suits that seemed out of place on his run-down doorstep. One tall, the other short, with faces obscured by mirrored sunglasses. Fear spiked, cold and sharp. They hadn't been in his dreams. These were real. Mr. Miller? The tall one asked, his voice devoid of inflection. Ethan didn't answer, unable to find words past the tightness in his throat. Please open the door, sir. We need to speak with you about a system-critical error, the shorter one said, voice flat, slightly robotic. The use of the word system struck a chord, sending a surge of terror through him. They knew. They were here because he'd tampered with the code. Maybe they were the simulation's enforcers, the ones who dragged broken code back into line. Maybe they were like antibodies, cleaning out a threat to the system's integrity. Go away, Ethan managed, his voice barely a whisper. That's not an option, Mr. Miller. Your cooperation would be preferable. The tall one spoke again, a subtle undercurrent of menace lacing his monotone. Panic propelled Ethan into action. Turning, he bolted down the narrow hallway, desperately searching for an escape. His apartment wasn't large. He knew every square inch and there was nowhere safe to hide. The back door led to the dingy fire escape, but that would just put him face to face with the mirrored figures below. The hammering at his front door began, rhythmic and insistent. Ethan darted into the bathroom, the only room with a lock, even a flimsy one. He slammed the door shut and engaged the pathetic deadbolt, hands shaking uncontrollably. From his crouched position behind the toilet, the window above the bathtub looked impossibly far. It was tiny, meant for ventilation, not escape. Yet, it might be his only chance. If he could get out on the roof, scramble across. It was a long shot, fraught with broken bones and angry suited figures, but certain doom lay behind him. Mr. Miller. The voice from the corridor seemed muffled, yet eerily close. We just want to clarify the if statement. Did you find it amusing? Amusing? Was this a game to them? He edged towards the window, heart thumping erratically in his ears. The door rattled, the deadbolt straining. He wouldn't have much time. The window squealed in protest as he forced it open, a blast of cold air cutting through the bathroom's damp warmth. Peering out, he saw the roof was lower than expected, a grimy asphalt expanse. A rusted drainpipe clung precariously to the side of the building. It was a terrible plan, the sort born of absolute desperation, but staying was no plan at all. Ethan heaved himself over the sill, legs scrambling for a foothold. The rough brick exterior scraped his skin. He managed to hook a leg around the drainpipe, its rusty embrace threatening to give way under his weight. Slowly, painfully, he lowered himself, terror making his grip clumsy. The drop wasn't far, but Ethan hit the asphalt with a sickening crunch. Pain exploded in his ankle, but he forced himself to scramble up, ignoring the wave of nausea. He needed distance, and fast. Hobbling across the roof, the city sprawled out below him, a maze of concrete and glass. 
The figures in black would be swarming his building any second. Had they even noticed his escape? Were they even capable of pursuit, or were they bound by the limitations of whatever code governed their existence? Questions swirled in his head. What were they? Agents of the simulation? Glitch cleaners? And why had they come for him? Did they erase people who peeked behind the veil, or just fix the corrupted code? He stumbled across a loose piece of roofing, nearly pitching headfirst into an alley several stories below. In the distance, sirens pierced the night. Someone might have heard the commotion at his door. Help was a tenuous hope, a lifeline he clung to nonetheless. If these men in black weren't human, weren't bound by normal laws, regular cops might just be his best bet. He spotted a fire escape at the end of the roof, a rusty ladder leading down into the web of alleyways. Every instinct screamed at him to keep running, to vanish into the shadows of the city. Yet a flicker of defiance sparked in him. He was tired of running, tired of living under the weight of a terrifying secret. If the simulation wanted him, let them come. Let them try and drag him back into their fabricated reality. He wouldn't make it easy, wouldn't let them erase him without a fight. Turning, he limped towards the ladder. As his foot touched the first rung, he glanced back at the city skyline. Was it just a trick of the light or the angle of the setting sun? But for a fleeting second, the building seemed to flicker, to waver like a digital projection struggling to maintain form. Ethan gripped the rusted iron rail, a grim smile twisting his lips. Maybe they'd underestimated him. Maybe just by knowing the nature of his cage, by defying them, he'd gained a power of his own. He descended into the gathering dusk, ready to face whatever came next. Be it men in black or the complete dissolution of everything he thought was real. The alley was a labyrinth of damp brick and overflowing dumpsters. Ethan pressed himself against a wall, panting, the throbbing in his ankle threatening to bring him to his knees. Shadows danced in his peripheral vision, the wail of approaching sirens growing louder. A sudden movement to his left made him flinch, just a scrawny cat, amber eyes gleaming in the gloom, disappearing into a storm drain. Ethan let out a breath he didn't realise he'd been holding. He needed to keep moving, find a place to hide until the police cars swarmed the area. The alley opened onto a narrow street, a mix of seedy bars and shuttered storefronts. No salvation here. He was about to slip back into the shadows when a flash of colour caught his eye. A neon sign buzzed above a darkened doorway, Retro Bites Arcade. Arcades were relics, but maybe one this out of the way had a back room, an unused supply closet. Anything to stay out of sight. The pounding of his own heart was deafening as he limped towards the door, his every nerve expecting the cold grip of the men in suits, expecting the world to dissolve around him. The door creaked open, a blast of old electronics and stale air washing over him. Inside, it was blessedly dark. The blinking lights of ancient arcade cabinets cast long, distorted shadows. For a panicked moment, Ethan wondered if this was another layer of the simulation, a trap designed to lure him in. But the musty smell of old carpet, the sticky floor beneath his feet, it was real, or as real as anything was anymore. A weak voice pierced the rhythmic beeps and digitised roars emanating from the machines. Place is closed, man. Ethan spun. Behind a faded Pac-Man cabinet, an old man in a grease-stained jumpsuit watched him, a frown creasing his weathered face. I... Uh, I need to hide, Ethan gasped, knowing he sounded desperate, bordering on crazed. There are people after me. The old man eyed him for a moment, then jerked his thumb toward the back. Storage room's through there. Ain't pretty, but I doubt your fancy friends will bother looking. Without waiting for thanks, Ethan hobbled through a narrow passage, grateful for the darkness that concealed his frantic limp. 
The storage room was a cluttered mess. Broken joysticks, faded game posters, a mountain of tangled wires. He wedged himself into the farthest corner, sinking to the dusty floor. The smell of machine oil and neglect offered the slightest sense of security. His breaths came in shuddering gasps as panic slowly receded. Okay, now what? Was escape even possible? Could a person run from a simulated world? He closed his eyes for a moment, trying to calm his thundering heart. He needed to think, not react. The question looped endlessly. What were they, those figures in black and mirrored shades? Did breaking the line of code turn him into a virus, a threat to the system? He desperately wanted to find a phone, call someone, anyone. But what would he even say? Hey, there might not be a real world at all, and I'm being hunted by glitch cleaners. That would earn him, at best, a padded room. At worst, Ethan flinched at the memory of that gaping insect maw reaching towards him. A flicker of movement above him made his blood run cold. Not the suits, something far worse. A spider, its bloated body the size of a fist, was slowly descending a silken thread. The gleam of its many eyes and the twitch of its hairy legs held him paralysed in horror. And then the thing paused. Its beady eyes seemed to fix on him, then tilted in what looked like... curiosity. The arcade pulsed with the electronic music of some forgotten game. Outside, the sirens had grown faint. Ethan was alone, save for the spider now a hair's breadth from his nose. It was almost beautiful in its grotesque way, the segmented legs moving with delicate precision. He felt a bizarre kinship with the creature, two anomalies in a world that might not be what it seemed. They were waiting, weren't they? Ethan's whisper hung in the air. He spoke to the spider, a totem of his broken reality. I messed with something, the code, whatever it is, and they came. The spider twitched again and began its slow ascent back toward the ceiling. Inspiration, as random and improbable as his current predicament, hit Ethan like a lightning strike. The spider, the creature in his cubicle. They weren't the guardians of the simulation. They were fellow victims, entities that had glitched through the cracks, anomalies the system sought to purge. He had no control over the simulation, but perhaps there were glitches he could exploit. Bugs born of a system trying desperately to keep him contained, to reset his memory. If he leaned into it, pushed further. Show me, he breathed a new sense of purpose replacing his fear. Show me how to break it. The flickering lights of a nearby asteroids machine intensified, taking on a strobing rhythm. Ethan staggered to his feet, a wave of vertigo washing over him as the room stretched and distorted around the pulsing game. This was it, a glitch, a crack in the digital veneer of his prison. He reached out and the world went blindingly white. When Ethan next opened his eyes, he was flat on the arcade floor, the harsh fluorescent lights of the office in the arcade stabbing at his brain. His head pounded, nausea roiling in his stomach. A circle of concerned faces hovered above him. Ethan, are you okay? Someone said you collapsed. Carl from security was there, his gruffness laced with genuine worry. What, what happened? Ethan rasped, struggling to sit up. His ankle throbbed, but the frantic beating of his heart was subsiding. We found you passed out by that old Gallagher machine. Maybe you're coming down with something, said Susan, a middle-aged woman from accounting who always had a tin of mints in her desk drawer. Memories threatened to swamp him. The line of code, the monstrous creature, the mirrored figures. I... I need to go home, he mumbled, not ready to process the full implications of what felt like a hallucinated, horrifying, near-death experience. Yes, Susan whispered. Home. Ethan looked up, expecting to see Susan and Carl. Instead, only the old man in his grease-stained jumpsuit met his gaze, 
a jolt of confusion replaced his fear. Ethan scrambled to his feet. Where were they? Had they simply vanished? A wave of dizziness washed over him, and he swayed, waiting for the throbbing ache in his ankle to return. Yet strangely, the pain was gone. What happened? Ethan whispered, his voice barely audible. The old man stared back, his expression unreadable. A flicker of something like pity crossed his face. Wordlessly, the old man gestured towards the exit. Ethan read the gesture clearly. It was time for him to leave. But questions burned in his mind. A desperate need for answers, warring with a sudden, overwhelming desire to escape. He spent the rest of the day in a daze, going through the motions as the normalcy of walking home was a shock. There were no impossible creatures loping out of the shadows, no mirrored sunglasses reflecting the streetlights. As far as he could see, the world was stubbornly, reassuringly ordinary. Was it all a delusion? Had the stress of the payroll system and the old code's echo led to some sort of mental break? Ethan found a twisted comfort in this explanation. Fear was easier to manage than the creeping suspicion that your entire reality was a lie. As he reached his apartment building, he hesitated. There was a chance, no matter how small, that they'd be waiting for him inside. That this break from the simulation life was temporary, another cruel illusion. But staying out in the open wasn't an option either. Home was the only familiar territory he had left, even if it was fraught with dangerous existential unknowns. Ethan took a deep breath and opened the door. His apartment felt different. It was too real. The worn sofa, the chipped mug on the counter. He wasn't just seeing these things. He was feeling their weight, the stubborn persistence of existing outside a digital framework. As he approached his computer monitor in his bedroom, he noticed something staring back at him. It was a stark comment line on the screen. Rem if real equals false, then go to ten. Ethan's mouth fell open. It was a scar, a reminder of a world still lurking behind the veil. The next few days passed in a strange limbo. Sleep became a waking nightmare. Each time Ethan's eyes closed, flashes of the creature's insectoid form and the sterile cruelty of the mirrored sunglasses haunted him. Work became rote, a mindless task he performed on autopilot while his thoughts spun in endless circles. Were his colleagues part of the simulation, actors playing their parts? If so, why hadn't his escape triggered a reset, a return to his blissful ignorance? Had he broken something more fundamental? He became acutely aware of the rhythm of the world around him, the predictable cycle of traffic lights, the way his elderly neighbour shuffled out to get her paper at precisely the same time every morning. His growing terror was punctuated by a grim fascination. If this was all code, could he trace its logic? Were there more glitches out there, cracks he could exploit? The payroll programme loomed on his desktop. Each day offered him the same choice. Leave it or uncomment the line. He couldn't resist. One evening, after clearing out the lingering office drones, he sat before the flickering screen, his decision made. His fingers flew over the keyboard. Rem, if real, equals false. Then go to ten. The change was almost anticlimactic. No tremor shook the room. No monstrous insects tore their way through the walls. Yet, a shift had occurred. The office around him seemed to dim, the certainty of the familiar world leeching away. He rose from his chair, a sense of anticipation coiling in his gut. The office door was his target. If this reality was false, surely pushing against its boundaries would expose the seams. As he neared the doorway, a figure stepped into view. His heart pounded so loudly he was sure it would give away his position. It was a man in a pristine black suit, his face obscured behind, you guessed it, mirrored sunglasses. 
The air crackled with tension. Ethan braced himself, not for attack, but for revelation. It was time to face his tormentors and demand answers. Mr. Miller, the suited figure said, his voice perfectly emotionless. That was quite reckless of you, 